There's a scripture that says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess. Confessing the name of Jesus. Do you reckon that every knee, that every tongue, that every person is going to confess the name of Jesus? Uh, the very beginning of the events that were taking place in scripture that changed the world and changed the world through the church, changed the world through individuals like you and me, no different than us, uh, no more empowered than us, just differently uh, affected all of eternity. There was a pivot point in eternity and that was because of the personage of Jesus Christ and his name. So today we're going to look at a story that's in the Bible. It actually took place. It took place just outside of the place that they call the temple in Jerusalem. The temple is the place under the old covenant where the Holy Spirit dwelt. Now the veil of the temple had been torn and the Holy Spirit left that temple and as of Acts chapter 2 the Holy Spirit was indwelling in the hearts, in the lives, in the spirit of individuals. So their bodies, like ours, became the temple of the Holy Spirit if they had accepted Christ. So then they had a responsibility and that was to take the message out. Now how would you draw a crowd if you were an individual who was trying to share the message of Jesus Christ? Free beer. <laughs> that would be one way to do it. That would be one way to do it, but probably wouldn't be the, the, uh, the most uh, upstanding way. They did something different. There was a miracle that took place. It was at the most popular entrance to the temple. It was a gate called Beautiful. Now, there was no gate called Beautiful, but there was a gate that everybody called Beautiful. It was a particular gate, probably on the south side of the temple, and it was uh, 200 and some something feet wide with double doors. There were two different gates that, that are speculated as might be this particular gate, but one of them was on the inside, a Corinthian gate made of brass. The other was on the outside, and this outside gate was probably where this man was put. Now, he was lame. You know what lame means? He couldn't walk. He was crippled. And, there, and the scripture gives us some details because this was written by a doctor, a doctor named Dr. Luke. He was crippled. And he would sit outside this gate and he would beg for, for actions, righteous acts of the people. And they call that, if you're reading it in the King James Version, they called it alms. And he would sit outside of the temple gate and he would say, I need a little bit of handout. I need some welfare from the people. I need what the scripture encouraged you to do and that is to give to the poor. And so he would sit out this, outside the temple gate and he would say, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. And you remember he was crippled sitting there and some smart aleck people would walk by and go, man, you don't need alms, you need legs. <laughs> that, that wasn't. And he would look at them and say, that's lame. But he was the one that was lame. And so I needed to get that out of my system because there was no way I was going to make it through the sermon without sharing that detail. Now, let's look at what took place in Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 starts starting in verse 1. Ironically, this was the very first sermon that I ever preached to the Cowboy Church of Ennis in 2005. It was, it is so significant. And the significance of this, I'm not going to share in great detail today, but I promise you, if you have ever seen, have, have any of you ever gone to a jewelry store and looked at diamonds through a loop through the, through the glass like that? If you have, then you could see the beauty of that diamond when you were sitting there. And they usually put that diamond, by the way, on something dark, like on dark blue or dark black, on velvet kind of thing. They'll set that diamond there. It's because in the darkness or in the midst of the darkness around it, the diamond shines the brightest. And as that diamond shines the brightest, it does not reflect its own light, but it reflects light that's from above and it just shoots off of there. And when you put that, that loop or that magnifying glass up to your eye, and I haven't had to do that in many, many years since before Carol and I got married because I haven't bought a lot of diamonds. Since. But as <laughs> As you look into that loop, you start to see that there are details, colors. There might be flaws or there might be benefits that you see in that diamond that you would have never seen with your eye without magnification. I didn't want to say naked eye because it, was, it didn't seem proper. So, 
Today, we're going to look at the diamond like it's sitting on that black velvet, and we're going to see some of the beauty, but over the next couple of weeks, we're going to go closer, and we're going to do that through the scripture, because the next, the rest of chapter 3, and then in its chapter 4, ver, uh, to, all the way to verse 22, looks at details, and the details will bring tears to your eyes as you look closely at this. Let's pray and just ask God to give us the foundation to look at this diamond. Father, I'm so grateful that today we have the opportunity to look at this particular event. We're going to see it today as an event and see a couple of potential applications to our own life within this. But Lord, I'm really even more grateful for the details that we're going to find as we look more closely at why this event was the particular healing that was recorded in the scripture. Why it was so impactful that Peter and John, those two guys that were on a mission going together, one of them speaking, one of them praying, but why it impacted the area so greatly that they ended up arrested and in prison because of it. Because of this event we're going to talk about today. Uh, the, the age of this man was important. It was, it was monumental. Lord, I, I pray that you will allow me to bring out what needs to be brought out for today and, and for us to look at the details over the next couple of weeks and see how this impacts not just us as individuals, but this church body and the body of Christ across this land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ooh. This man had been sitting at this temple gate for 40 years. He was over 40 years old. Acts chapter 4 verse 22 says. There was something that was complete about 40 years. You know the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. This might be the message in about 2 or 3 weeks. But the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. It was for 40 days and nights that the floods hit the earth. For 40 days Jesus revealed himself after his ascension. He was tempted in the desert in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. When Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments in Levitical law. Guess how long he was there? Forty days. There are forty days and forty years that fall all through the scripture. In fact, uh, I was looking at many of those and I'm going to probably do an entire sermon on the power of this number. And so if any of you are forty years old, this is a great time for you. Forty days and forty years was so significant in scripture that King Saul reigned for forty years. The man that followed him, King David, reigned for forty years. Solomon, who followed him, reigned for 40 years. There were a number of five or more judges that, uh, that were in that role for 40 years. And this man was 40 years old because there was something that was going to be a new life that took place after 40 years. Guess how many weeks it takes for a woman to reach full gestation when she is pregnant? No, 38. <laughs> no, it is 40. I'm kidding. Uh, some babies can be born at 38. Some babies can be born at 42. But they, if they are born at 41 or 42, they say that baby is going to walk out on its own because it's past time. Its baby's grown. Um, 40, 40 weeks is the proper gestation for, or the full term gestation for a child. This blows my mind. Now, here's why this blows my mind. This fella was sitting outside the temple gate, sitting outside the temple gate, all through the three plus years of Jesus' ministry. Does that blow your mind? Jesus was in that temple when he cleared that temple because of righteous uh, decree of anger because they were making a mockery of the temple. And it was a picture for me to clear my temple whenever I start making a mockery of Christ in my own life. But the fact is that it was something that Jesus was doing. This guy was sitting outside the temple gates. The scripture is going to tell us that. Why didn't Jesus heal him? Because he wasn't due yet, <laughs> I guess. Because there needed to be 40. It's like his rebirth needed to be complete. There's pictures for that that I'm going to share with you in a, in a week or two as we look at details of this. That's the end of the story. Have, are you piqued to know that there are facets to this that could blow your mind? There are facets of this that blow my mind. Let's look at what took place and why I wondered, did Jesus not heal the fellow? 
Was it because when Jesus was healing people in Jerusalem and in the temple area, after he had cleansed the temple uh, and that was a big uproar, the children were playing and coming to him and, and the sick and the lame and the blind and, and the deaf and those not so smart or dumb, they couldn't hear either. They were coming and, and, and they, were, they were being healed. The, the deaf could hear, the blind could see, the lame could walk. And, and this guy's sitting out there just sitting outside the temple. Why didn't he get healed? Hmm. Maybe we'll learn that when we get to heaven. Maybe we'll see some of the reasons in a moment. Let's look at this event. And then we'll go to Luby's. Or wherever we go. I don't know. I don't think there's even a Luby's in this part of Texas. I think they're way up in Plano. Alright. Acts 3 verse 1 through 26. One day, and you already know the story. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. It was at 3 in the afternoon. There were two main times for prayer. One was 9 a.m. Acts chapter 2 talked about that. It's the time of prayer. These men are not drunk. And then at 3 in the afternoon. During the middle of that, there were sacrifices that took place and things. It seemed that the sacrifices, and I'm, I'm going by something that I read. I, I, I wasn't there, so I can't verify it. But it seemed the sacrifices stopped during the, time, the hours of prayer. And at 3 in the afternoon. Now it's interesting that the times of prayer was 9 in the morning and 3 in the afternoon. Guess when Jesus was put on the cross? 9 in the morning. And the scripture says that it was at 3 in the afternoon when he died on the cross. When he said it is finished and his body gave up his spirit, it was 3 in the afternoon. Now if you're reading in the King James Version or some of the other translations that use the time frame from that day, it would say it was the ninth hour. And the ninth hour is the time frame that we're looking at here. The, the reason it says ninth hour, it's the same thing as three in the afternoon. <clears throat> they started their day at our 6 a.m. was 12 o'clock. And so by the time you got to noon, it was six. I mean, yeah, by the time you got to noon, it was the sixth hour. And by the time you got to 3 a.m., it was the ninth hour. It's the same thing. And my clock was backwards to you there. And I know that annoyed some people who are OCD. But the fact is that it would work the same but upside down. All right. Now, <laughs> I resemble that, by the way. Um, as we look at this scripture today, there's something significant about the hour that Jesus uh, gave mankind the greatest healing when he said it is finished and paid the price for my sin on the cross and yours and the healing that took place here at this specific time. Let's look at the picture. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer about three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth, he was, he was crippled or lame. His, he, he wasn't, um, it, he, he was crippled because of his legs not working. It wasn't a title for him. It was a fact. He accepted this so much that for all of these years he faced this every day. Maybe he didn't even believe that he could be healed all the way from birth. Did he have ankles and feet that were deformed? Yes, because the scripture talks about how those ankles and those feet came together because Dr. Luke uh, addressed that. Did he have polio or something when he was a child? Possibly. We just don't know. We just know that it was from birth. He was being carried to the temple. He had to be carried because he could not walk. And he was carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. This one that they identified as the most beautiful gate. Where he was put every day. He was put there every day to bed from those who were going into the temple courts. Uh, if those people carried him there and Jesus had been there for three years plus, why didn't they take him to Jesus? Maybe because it wasn't time. Maybe because he thought, you know, my legs don't work but they don't hurt. I'm doing a pretty good living here because everybody that's going into the temple to sacrifice, they know that they know that the scripture tells them they not only need to give 10% to the Lord, but they need to give alms or 10% to the poor. And so he was there maybe making a very good living. It's real possible that though he was a beggar, it didn't say he was poor, it just said he was a beggar. It's real possible that those beggars... They could do nothing about their legs being uh, in, uh, ineffective. They couldn't do anything about that, but they were probably being taken care of and maybe being taken care of well. This man was put there every day to beg 
possibly because it was a good business, from those going to the temple courts. So if you're going into the temple courts and you've got your 10% to give to the upkeep of the temple, you've got your 10% to give to the personnel of the temple, and you know that God, in order to accept your sacrifice, needs to know that your heart is pure and you've given your portion to the poor, then it's possible that those just out the temple outside the temple gates were the token poor that these individuals gave to. It wasn't out of a necessarily a good heart. They should have been given to and taking care of the poor all the time. But just before they went in the temple, they could have said, we're going to take care of this so that God accepts our sacrifice. And they gave their alms to that individual who's sitting there. So he was lame from birth. Those going in the temple courts were giving him these gifts somehow. I'm not going to go into details of what gate that might have been. Because does it matter which gate it was? No. Does it matter what it symbolizes? Yes. And we're going to see a little bit of that today. We're going to see more of what that gate symbolized over the next week or two. Relating to Israel, they were symbolically lame outside of relationship with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had left the place where he spoke to them. Relating to us, we're born into this world spiritually lame. It's like born from birth into a world of sin is what all of us have been because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 says. We need Jesus to make Make us whole. We need Jesus to, to open up that relationship, to tune our hearts and to tune our minds into the frequency of God. And the Holy Spirit is the only one who can tune our hearts or our mind into God's frequency. Then we can hear from him. And the lame man, Israel, and us today all need what Peter and John were sharing. And this is the simple picture, and it's a profound picture, even though it should be simple for us to see. The lame man accepted what his condition was. It was permanent. Could do nothing about that. So he only asked for what he could receive there. He didn't ask anybody for healing. I don't know why he didn't ask Jesus. Again, maybe the Lord will give some revelation on this over the days ahead. But he didn't ask for healing. Now, he wouldn't have known that Peter and John could heal him anyway, but Jesus, the Messiah, the one who rose from the grave and showed himself for 40 days, that was proof enough. Surely he could have gotten healed if he'd have reached out to Jesus himself. But there was something else required here, and that was part of the church on mission needed to reach out to him. There was a lesson in this. It's possible that when Jesus was at the temple and he was doing all of the healings and the things that he did in Jerusalem, around Jerusalem, around that whole area, every time that he walked by and saw the lame man over there, he smiled. One day, that picture is going to be complete. That guy is not being punished. It was not because of sin that he's facing these things. It's because there's a picture that needs to be completed. And the picture is going to be the springboard for all of Christianity of what God is doing for mankind. I like that a whole lot. Alms means mercy or pity or charity, that donation. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talked about alms also, especially if you're reading in the King James Version. Because in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, it says, Jesus said, now take heed that you do not do your alms before men. If you're reading in, in the NIV or some of the other more modern translations, it says your righteous actions, because it was a righteous action to give to the poor. But he said, don't do this before men so that others can see your works to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. But do your alms or your righteous acts so that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. You do it for the sake of serving God, not for the sake of being seen by men. When you do alms, verse 3 says, Let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Thine alms should be done so that mankind does not glorify you, but that your Father in heaven will be uh, glorified. And then it says, And the Father which has seen what took place in secret will reward you openly, possibly here on earth, definitely in heaven. Something interesting about the alms or the provision that he had, they always ran out. They were never adequate. They did not feed him, obviously, enough to take care of him long term. Or he was just so hungry that, uh, not physically hungry, but hungry for money or something, that he just kept building on these things. But he never was satisfied. He obviously never was satisfied because he was there every day. Verse 3 says, when Peter, when he saw, when the 
lame or the beggar man saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. He said, alms for the poor, a righteous act for a man who can't get up, who can't walk, who can't get around on his own. And Peter looked straight at him, and so did John, the scripture says in verse 4. When you walk through a mall and you see individuals with a clipboard there ready to take a, a survey or something, do you look them in the eye? Never. Don't look them in the eye. I'm just telling you. Because they'll go, oh, sir. And you can't even be nice and go, good morning. Oh, no. Oh, I'm hooked. Oh, I've got to. Um. And then you got to answer all their silly questions, whatever those are. I, I actually don't do that. I go, no, thank you. Got to run. <laughs> really? On the oh, I have no watch. But I... Um, <laughs> Know that this fellow was, was sitting there. There was a reason that he didn't make eye contact with him. They looked at him, but he apparently, according to the scriptures, didn't look up at them. And there was something about this. It might tell us more than what I've assumed and, and thought incorrectly about him. His, his character and nature might have been of humility. It might have been that, and I'll just go swing that pendulum all the way the other way. It might have been that his inability to get up from where he was meant that he used the bathroom right where he was sitting. It might have meant that he felt dirty. He knew that he couldn't go into the temple because those who were, who had an issue uh, of sores or blood or something else or, or potentially even lameness, hands or feet that don't work, couldn't go into the temple. They had to be cleansed. They couldn't go in broken like that. So he, he maybe had never been in the temple. It may be never. Peter looked at this guy sitting there as did John. Then Peter said, hey buddy, look at us. Lift your eyes up. And there's a lot of people who are walking through life and their eyes are down. They can't look you in the eye. They, they don't want to look anybody in the eye. And it's not because... It's not because they're not worthy or whatever. It's that they don't feel worthy. And so if somebody looks them in the eye and, and, and acts like, I care about you, immediately they want to look down. Immediately they want to look off to the side. Maybe they heard that in the scripture, the eyes are the window to the soul and they didn't want their soul to be revealed. That's where the battle goes on in our mind before doing the good and the bad. Peter said, look at us. Look at us, plural, like me and John. Look at us. And the beggar looked up. Now he gave him his attention, the verse 5 says, because he expected to get something from them. If anybody said, hey, look at us, beggar, maybe they've got something grand to give. Maybe they're going to give, maybe, they're, maybe they were saying, hey, um, we just bought a new truck and this truck is yours. And so they were going to give him a truck. That would have given him freedom to get around. I don't know if they had trucks back then. Maybe a donkey. Maybe, maybe a lot of money. The beggar looked up, expecting to get something from them. He followed the order, fully expecting to receive. But then Peter said something that kind of bursted his bubble. Peter said in verse 6, silver and gold I do not have. I got no monies. <laughs> I got no money. But what I do have, I will give to you. Now, if there was a pause from the time that Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. If there was a pause there, the beggar would have been processing, what could he have that was not money that would bless me somehow? What would he have that I would want? Maybe food? Maybe he had something like a, a new wet red wagon to ride in. Almost said wed wagon, but that would have been backwards. Maybe he had maybe they had a new cart for him so that he didn't have to depend on other people. Maybe they put a donkey with it, he could get around everywhere. Maybe they had lottery tickets and gave him a chance at something grand and going on. I don't know what they had back then. And I don't know what he thought. But when Peter said silver and gold that we don't have, in something inside of him probably went, oh. Another peanut butter and jelly sandwich that they were going to eat on their own. Oh well, I'll take it. Another fish and loaf. But then Peter said something that... I don't, know, I don't know why Jesus didn't heal him before, but it was Jesus who healed him now. Through the people of Jesus Christ, through the children of God, only through the power of the name of Jesus... Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Walk 
In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I'm going to tell you not only who it is, I'm going to specify who it was because of where he's from. You've heard of this man. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. No one took him to the healings before. Did he want this healing now? I don't know. I don't know. It didn't say, by faith, the man then stretched out his little foot. It, it, it wasn't the beggar's faith, apparently, that healed him. It was the faith in Jesus Christ and the power that flowed through Peter. And as he did, the scripture says in verse 7, Peter reached down by the right hand. Why did it specify right hand? Why didn't it just say, hey, he reached down with his hand and picked him up? Because there's facets to this diamond that are beautiful. And this is one of those. As he reached down by the right hand, he helped him up. Peter passed on the blessing. In the scripture, we hear about how, how Jacob reached out with his right hand to bless Joseph's son Manasseh in Genesis chapter 48, verse 13. 13 through 15. We hear that Jesus is at the right hand of the throne of God. I say in weddings there have been lands that have been bought and sold by the right hand of two individuals who said, I make this commitment to you. There have been wars that have been ended because of the right hand fellowship. This uh, word that I used last week for fellowship was a Greek word called koinonia, which meant we are in one heart, we are one spirit, and the right hand tells us this. When this when Peter reached out his right hand. Do you know in the culture of that day, they didn't necessarily reach out their right hand unless there was a harmony there because their right hand was clean. I'm going to say something that is off color and I apologize if you're offended by it. They didn't have toilet paper in those days. They had a left hand. They, if their hands were unclean, it was not their right hand, it was their left hand. And when Peter reached out to him, and they had running water, they could wash their hands for heaven's sakes, and they had that, that stuff that you, you can squirt on this. Yeah. I don't know if they had it or not. But, but he didn't reach out the hand that would normally reach to a beggar or an unclean person. He reached out a koinonia, fellowship, right hand, and he said, you're my brother. It was not until Peter reached out his hand that the fella started to get up. Maybe he didn't have strong enough belief or faith on his own. He didn't get up on his own. He didn't believe on his own at that time. There was something that took place because of the faith of Peter and John. And I'm going to explain why it says what it says a little later on in chapter 3 in the week or two ahead. Taking him by the right hand as Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Peter was interceding for him. Peter helped him up. And it says instantly. Now Luke was a physician. Luke knew how to read x-rays because he said something that looked at a detail. He said two words in this very next verse, in verse, uh, in verse chapter 7, at the end of verse chapter 7, that, uh, that were not used any time out of the entire word of God, Old Testament and New Testament. He used the word feet and he used the word ankles. Feet or ankles in this Greek word were not used throughout the entire Bible. But he was using actually something that was a medical term or what would be seen as a medical term of that day. Look at what happened. Peter reached out his right hand, helped him up and instantly, instantly, didn't take time. That's going to, that's going to heal one of these days. It, it didn't take time for, for rehabilitation. Surgery takes place four to six months later. You're going to be able to walk and it's not going to hurt in about eight to ten months. But we're going to teach you how to walk again. This man had never walked. He had never walked before. It takes, it takes little toddlers with their legs that are strong enough. It takes them a while to learn to balance. And, and they walk like a little drunk people before that. And they got that big old head and they're walking into tables and stuff. And you've got to kind of watch them and... This guy didn't need that. There's something unique that took place. Instantly, the man's feet, Luke, Dr. Luke said, and ankles, Dr. Luke said, became strong. He jumped to his feet now. It's like he went, boom, I can walk. He was excited about this. He jumped to his feet. He began to walk. Then he went in with them into the temple courts. He, had, he maybe had never been in the temple courts in all of his life. This is how we know this gate was on the outside. 
He went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God like a silly schoolgirl that had just won a prom queen. I don't know if what. He, he was so excited. He was so excited. He didn't care who saw him celebrate Jesus. He didn't care who saw him celebrate the fact that he was healed. He didn't, he didn't get up and go, ah, oh, I'm healed. Oh, I look goofy. I'm just going to walk cool now. And he got that swagger. He didn't do that. What he did was celebrate life because he had new life. Like a person who just for the first time in their life feels the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and the lift of the burden of guilt that they've been carrying for so many years jumped to his feet. Then he went with them into the temple courts. He was walking and jumping and praising God and being silly. Verse 9 says, when all the people saw him, and they all did, he was making such a scene for heaven's sakes. When all the people saw him walking around and praising God, they recognized him. Hey, that's the dude. For 40 years, has been sitting outside. I, saw, I watched him grow up. He went from here to here. <laughs> he never could walk. He was, well, you know, we saw him grow from here to here. I don't know. They saw him, they recognized him, and they recognized and the scripture says, and it's a fact, as the same guy, the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder. That blows my mind. That guy could never walk, and yet he's walking. They were filled with amazement at what had happened to him. Acts chapter 4 verse 22 is a place where it says he was 40 years old. We'll examine that in the weeks ahead. As they went into the temple, the scripture says he couldn't stop hugging them. Oh, Peter, give me one more hug. John, give me one more hug. Peter, give me one more hug. I saw it. John, give me one more hug. He kept holding on to them because he was so blessed. He was so blessed with something he never expected. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished. And they came running. This was like, this was like, uh, this was like throwing money out into a, a, a group of individuals. If you, if you went into uh, downtown Dallas um, or a convention center with a whole bunch of people there, kids or adults, I don't care who it is, and you throw out about $100,000 to drop it from the ceiling, you think mayhem is going to take place? People from outside. There's money flying down from the ceiling. They come from everywhere. People started coming around because there was something that they thought they would never see before because the prophet had been dead. Prophet Jesus. And they're learning. And they're going to learn through the message that Peter is going to share. He was not just a prophet. And he's not dead. He lives in me. And his power is being revealed through the apostles. And it's being passed on to you and me. And I'll show you how as the weeks go on ahead. Peter knew how to draw a crowd. All the people were astonished. They came running into the place called Solomon's Colonnade. Jesus talked about this. It was a porch called Solomon's Porch. Now Solomon was the, the richest, potentially, he, he, I think he was the richest of all the kings. And Solomon's Porch or Colonnade had to be a glorious, magnificent, fantastic, huge, but very ornate, golden place. And that's where the Christians, that's where the believers in Jesus Christ started meeting See, Jesus had done teachings there in John chapter 10, verse 23. By Acts chapter 5, verse 12, they started meeting there on the first day of the week. Why the first day of the week? Because that was the resurrection day. That's why we meet on the first day of the week, because they met on the first day of the week. Because Jesus showed himself to those disciples on the first day of the week, the day that he rose from the grave. And then next Sunday, he showed them again, the first day of the week. And we come to meet Jesus on this day also. These are the things we're going to look at over the next week or two. We're going to look at Peter's sermon, second sermon in the, of 23 sermons in the book of Acts. We're going to look at how he addressed the crowd. And then the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up and they said, We don't like what you're doing, Peter and John. And they arrested them. And as Peter and John were arrested, the church was still growing. You see, it said that 3,000 came to know Christ that first day. They believed. They saw the power and they saw the Holy Spirit come down. They saw miracles taking place. When Peter and John were arrested, it says that day about 5,000 were added. Or it grew to 5,000, depending on the translation you're looking at. Either way, there was something magnificent taking place because of the power of what? One thing, the name of Jesus 
that at the name of Jesus, why did we sing all those songs about the name of Jesus? You could claim that name. You can claim that power. You can claim that freedom that takes place from that. This man that was a former beggar was healed and he was voluntarily staying close. Just like somebody wanting to be discipled. Just like somebody wanting to grow. Peter and John were told by the Sanhedrin when they took him out of the, the uh, prison. And I'll talk about this next week. When they took him out of the prison they said, This name, this Jesus name you've been talking about, we command you with threats. They gave him a lot of threats. We threaten you and your life and your livelihood and we command you not to teach or speak of the name of Jesus anymore. And Peter and John said about the things that we've seen and heard. Even if you tell us not to speak a word, we can't help but tell. We can't help it. This life is temporary, but the life we have in Jesus Christ is eternal. We have a responsibility. There are needy people out in your workplace. There are needy people in this world. Some of you, uh, and me too, walk past them. And uh, Do you ever avoid people who look like they're needy? Don't look them in the eye. I don't care if they don't have a clipboard. Don't look them in the eye. They're crying. That's going to be uncomfortable. Don't look them in the eye. They look like they're looking for somebody to... You ever been at the gas station and you're putting gas in your car and somebody comes up and, and you go, while you're right there, I'll talk to you. That's what you do, by the way. You stop them where they're at and, and then you say, I'll talk to you in, in my, uh, my comfort distance and all. One time a guy, I, I think I told you about this, but I was getting gas somewhere in Central Texas and, um, and a guy walked, I, I'm always aware, almost always aware of everything around me. He got all the way up to me before he said, sir or whatever, can I, and he scared the wadden out of me. I'm telling you straight up. I was like, what? And I told him, I said, I'll talk to you, but you go stand over there in the grass. And when I get done pumping gas, because I couldn't get to my gun at that moment. <laughs> but I said, you go stand over there in the grass and I'll talk to you. And, and, he, and he did. And he was, a, he was a beggar guy. But he walked over there and he stood in the grass. And he waited until I got done pumping the gas there. And I was so uh, grateful for his obedience that I gave him $5. And I said, I know what you're going to do with this. <laughs> Brother, I appreciate the fact that you're obedient. <laughs> and 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 that because he kind of blindsided me there and they, listen, there's needy people today that won't look you in the eye sometimes because they just feel so unworthy. They feel completely guilty. And there are some needy people that hate the fact that they're needy, but they are. And our responsibility is to say, Hey, look me in the eye. Look me in the eye and I'll put out my right hand because I care. The hand of blessing, the hand of koinonia, the hand of fellowship. And I'll help you walk. That's our responsibility. What God wants from our church as we've seen over the months ahead is to broaden our mindset and think about missions, to think about the needs, to think beyond our circle because we're doing some good things in this circle. There's more that we can always do and the job's never done. But he wants us to expand our circle. Peter and John were doing that as they did this. They recognized people need. They looked them in the eye. They reached out their hand and they brought them into the family. And there was nobody closer to Peter and John than this man. There are people who will always let you down. I learned years ago, and, and it, I think it would be rare. I'm disappointed sometimes when people disappoint me, but, but I kind of have a protection up there. I expect you to disappoint me, and I hope you expect me to disappoint you, because that's just the nature of people, okay? Just don't feel like the world has been pulled out from under you, because Jesus will never disappoint you. His name is always consistent. He is always there, and nobody can take you out of his hand. But sometimes we disappoint one another. That's okay. We're people, all right? When we are recognizing where our foundation is, if we'll keep our focus on that name of Jesus and the one who has given his life for us, then we're going to have something to offer. Here's the last thing. You may say, Michael, my name is not Simon Peter and I didn't walk with Jesus for three years. I don't know what to say. Peter shared with them the word. He shared with him love. The most important thing he shared with him, I think, was that looking him in the eye and then reaching out his hand. 
But if you don't know what to say because you don't know the Bible very good, get to know one verse. Own one verse. It might be Acts 16 verse 31, the verse that says, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved from whatever that is that hurts. If you said that to some people who are hurting, then they might put their trust in the name of Jesus. All you got to know is one verse. The Lord could expand those things. You might learn two verses. You might learn John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life. That's not hard. You probably already know those two verses. You might add to that John 14.6, the one where Jesus said, Nobody comes to the Father but by me because I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's not hard, and you don't have to know a lot. Just be equipped in your spiritual pocket to have that one verse and say, God, give me an opportunity to look somebody in the eye, to reach out my hand, and to share with them your word. And they will hug you the rest of the day. <laughs> now, maybe physically, but emotionally and spiritually, you'll go, God, I feel good that I did something good. Those are the arms of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, for those who have not accepted you as Savior, they heard the three verses that are my favorites in the Bible for sharing salvation. You loved us so much that you gave your Son. Jesus, inspired through Paul to say, it's not hard, you don't have to clean up, just believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Because there is no other way, because he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And no one will come to heaven. No one will come to the Father except through him. Lord, may this day be a day where some fella, some lady, and maybe somebody who's already saved, says, I've been hanging my, uh, my life, my my identity on human beings and I need to place my identity in the one who identified himself with me on the cross. I need to place my identity and then walk forward not limited and crippled by the things of this world physically, emotionally but Lord free. It's time. It's time Lord and you're drawing the net and may you draw people's hearts to you today. Lord, we looked at just the picture today, just the event, but Lord, may this event be profound. The very first sermon that I ever preached for the Cowboy Church of Ennis in 2005, this particular sermon, it was very different back then, but Lord, I pray that now in the maturity that you brought us as a church together, we will reach out to the needs of people in a unique way golden, beautiful way as you supply the healing through your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you as you go. Thank you.